I'm Dr. Shannon Waterman, faculty at Swedish Family Medicine, um, uh, Cherry Hill, and wanted to introduce our speakers for the day, um, <clears throat> Dr. Molly Mason and uh, Dr. Zoe Ginsberg, who um, are going to be talking to us about fat phobia and the care of larger body people. I um, want to thank everybody for participating, joining us this morning. Um, we're going to um, hear from Dr. Neeson and Dr. Ginsburg and then have time at the end in order to um, take questions. If you have questions as the presentation is going, feel free to put them in the chat and I will try to follow that um, and we'll take questions at the end. Um, and then um, if you need any technical troubleshooting, please also put that in the text um, chat box and the Seattle Science Foundation staff or myself can try to troubleshoot that for you. And with that, I offer it to Dr. Neeson and Dr. Ginsburg. Good morning, everyone. My name is Molly Neeson, and I'm here with Zoe Ginsburg, my colleague and best friend, <laughs> to talk to you guys today about um, fat stigma in healthcare and uh, kind of devising some better ways to take care of our lar larger body patients. Our hope today is that we can together challenge the discrimination and moralization against fat people and consider the stigma that providers have against them as important um, as the metabolic consequences that may come from their weight. First, a quick note on language. Um, we use the word fat um, kind of in solidarity with fat activists. This has been reclaimed in a similar way that queer has been reclaimed. Um, and overweight, obese, and morbidly obese um, are generally kind of considered stigmatizing language, even though it is also medical, highly medicalized. Um, so we um, shy away from using that, although we do sometimes use it in this presentation. However, it is really important to reflect back people's language to them. So if your patients are using that language, it, I think it is okay to use that as well. So just thinking um, ahead to some of our objectives, our goal is by the end of this presentation that our participants will be able to have an idea of what fat phobia is, what thin privilege is, and where they manifest, particularly within the medical sphere where we operate. We hope that you'll be able to articulate the bio, psycho, and social impact of fat phobia in healthcare. Um, we'd also like to outline and kind of dispel some of the myths about the medical significance of fatness and give an idea of what the most current research is showing rather than that we've learned from our implicit education in medicine or bias-based education in medicine. We would really, our primary goal is to challenge the idea that fatness necessarily is equivalent to unhealthiness. Um, we hope that you'll be able to increase your awareness and self-reflection um, about these topics with providers and discuss strategies moving forward to counter fat phobia and health. Care. We're going to spend a little time characterizing the quote unquote epidemic, talking about the epidemiological um, background of the epidemic, um, as well as some of the moralization about the epidemic. Um, we bring to you some um, pictures, headless bodies. <laughs> some headless bodies. Um, this often, you know, often oh, um, fat folks are. Um, shown headless and kind of dissociated. It comes with this sort of moral panic. You can see these um, kids with these warning signs. Um, and this is also in the background of like ever thinner bodies. So it's um, uh, just kind of like there, there's these competing messages that are shown. Um, and at the same time, fat folks are often characterized as kind of lazy, sloppy, um, slow, unmotivated. Um, so we're kind of gonna um, break down what some of that means. So a note on why we use quotations around the obesity epidemic. We challenge the, the terminology of the obesity epidemic. We feel that it really focuses on an individual failure rather than a systemic site of treatment and focus. We feel that it's particularly stigmatizing and moralizing language and engenders what um, Dr. Ginsburg noted as this moral panic. Um, and as you will, we will discuss later, some of the, the ways that we have characterized obesity over time through the NIH have actually maybe kicked off what we call the obesity epidemic by classifying more people as obese. So we'll get into that a little bit. We will not argue that the population has not gotten fatter over time, but we will argue that it has been exacerbated by a variety of factors. Um, 
thinking about the epidemic and how it's been popularized in the media, in the late 90s to early 2000s, there were more articles published about obesity than there were about the AIDS pandemic or pollution. Um, we also see that over half of articles um, during a similar time period used alarming metaphors calling obesity like a time bomb. So it was like kind of militarized, threatening language. Um, and over 72% of photographs portraying fat people have these stigmatizing images. They're always, you'll notice, headless. They're like slumped over. They're eating a burger and just like all these like kind of like formulating this, the, this um, kind of confluenced image of a fat person, as um, Zoe said, is like fat, sloppy, not thinking about what they eat. And that's kind of the, the image of fat people that has been instilled with us. And then we move forward to this very um, kind of serious looking man. His name is Adolf Quetele. He was not a physician. He practiced in the 1830s through 50s. He was firmly uh, seated within the eugenics movement, though it was not called that at the time. Um, and he is the person from which the BMI was founded. It was in, at the time called the Quetelet Index. And Quetelet's goal as a scientist was to find the mean or average, most average man, which I will argue is not only sexist, but also eugenicist. Um, he was focusing like, where is the most common body, most common person? Um, of note, he only looked at white people, um, shocker, shocker, in the history of medicine, particularly racist. Um, so he only focused on French and, French and Scottish participants and created the Quetelet Index as a way of measuring the body mass of a, like over a population in order to find this mean. So it's important to note that this Quetelet Index, which later became the BMI, was never meant to be an individual measure of body mass, body size, body composition. Then um, in the early 20th century, like US life insurance population uh, companies were the first people to bring the Quetelet Index into medicine actually um, and connect it with people's health. So it wasn't actually coming from any kind of medical society, any kind of medical intention, but it was like this measurement that US life insurances were able to discriminate people against. And then in 1972, a group of researchers along with Keyes kind of coined Quetelet's Index as the body mass index and they compared it to other measures of skin, of um, body, composition at the time. So using like skin calipers or submerged body mass. And that's when BMI became the primary way that we talk about body size in medicine. And then in 1985, soon after that paper, um, soon after in the scope of medical time, um, the NIH uh, tied their definition of obesity to the BMI, which then they were able to kind of like broaden, narrow, really not, I'm sure it wasn't willy nilly. I'm sure they thought about it. Um, I'm oversimplifying. They were able to broaden and simplify the definition of obesity, which drastically changes our numbers as we're looking at the population. Um, and we'll see in 1998, they significantly lowered the threshold of BMI. Um, I believe it was from 28 to 25, 27 to, to 25. 27 to 25. Um, and here we kind of see, as we're gonna look at some graphs where we see kind of the takeoff of the popularization and the panic over the obesity epidemic. So in order to demonstrate that to you, I found the, this US retail market graph really fascinating. So this is looking at the market for um, low calorie foods and beverages, supplements, meal replacement, weight loss center, pharmaceuticals. Um, I have so much commentary about the predatory and capitalist nature of this that I will try to refrain myself from getting into, but those of you who know me know that that's just right beneath the surface. But we see here in 1999, so this, this change of the definition of obesity happens in 98, and then we can, I'm pointing at the screen as if you can see. Um, and then <laughs> after 99, we see this takeoff of the market. Um, of, and I presume, I think of this as a proxy for the panic that people are feeling. Um, and yes, the world is getting fatter at this time. And Zoe's gonna talk about that in a second. And then moving forward, we see, how, we see how this takes off into the future. So this is just from a different source, but again, shows how from throughout the 2000s, and I'm sure continuing now that the, the market for weight loss materials and consumption has just taken off. And to just look at how that correlates pretty well with the redefinition of obesity to me demonstrates what the, the result of the panic around the pandemic is. 
Um, this is a very busy slide and I'm going to walk you through it. Um, there's not great, um, beautiful data that shows rises in BMI starting like from early. Um, this data is starting in 1960 and going to 2008. And the left panel is for women and the right panel is for men. Unfortunately, it's not kind of just aggregated. Um, and this is broken down by race. So, um, the blue line is white folks, the white, the red line is um, Hispanic folks and the black, uh, the black line is black folks. Um, and um, it's also broken down by um, percentile of BMI. So it's a little confusing, but what this graph is just trying to show you is that throughout time, um, the, there is a slow but steady rise in BMI that rises, a a little bit faster starting in about 2000. Um, and it is important to note that there is a change in, obese, in the definition of obesity um, in from o the overweight category goes from 27.8, the BMI ch changes from 27.8 to 25. So that means that overnight, basically a woman who's five feet and four, five feet four um, and 155 pounds is suddenly considered overweight in, um, in 1998. Um, we have moved gold posts for other diseases too, like including hypertension and prediabetes. So this isn't um, unique to obesity. Um, it's also really important to note that there are um, big racial disparities here. Um, and you know, that is, this is based on BMI. So we have already debunked like BMI is racist in its, um, in its, in its core. It's, it was only designed for certain bodies to be begin with. Um, but it also like is um, could be based on um, racial oppression and other things like that. Um, thank you. Um, this next slide is starting from 1990 and actually is a New England Journal of Medicine article that predicts epidemiological data through 2030. Um, and is just a different way to show that um, there is increasing incidence of obesity. Um, the left is BMI over 30 and the right is BMI over 35. Um, and it shows that there is disproportionate um, burden, um, particularly in the South. Um, and again, this like may have to do with um, other kind of um, axes of oppression too. Um, so what I'm trying to tell you is that like, it is true that obesity has been increasing um, in the United States and we're not arguing that. Our question is what, what do we do with that and how can we support our patients with the background of knowing that there is this moral panic that um, the society is kind of give, putting on them. There is this weight loss industry that is predatory um, and there is a huge amount of stigma that we're gonna get into um, some of the research about that. So as we're looking at all this data, we've already mentioned about the way that the BMI is imperfect in its founding and in its kind of intentions originally. I'd also like to mention that it's just an, a, an awful measure of what body composition actually is. It doesn't measure what adiposity is. So as you know, BMI can't differentiate between lean body mass and fat body mass. So someone who's really incredibly muscular, such as myself, <laughs> might have a really high BMI, but be really healthy. So it doesn't really have a, a good correlation to what someone's body composition is. We know it's particularly a terrible um, predictor of adiposity in children. So many of us will see that we, we mostly use percentiles of height and weight in children rather than BMI. Um, so can we reliably use BMI to monitor change in body composition? We argue no, and throughout our talk we'll be both using a lot of data that's based on BMI because that is the what the institution has been using, but we're also going to discuss some alternatives and ideas for moving forward in order to, if we want to do research correlating body weight, you, we like narrowing the research questions we're asking so that we can actually find the data that we're looking for. Um, next, we're going to be moving forward. So we all know that the development of a fat body is multifactorial. We know that, um, and our primary goal is to argue that it's not an individual moral failing. It's not someone who's just kind of let themselves go or um, is emotionally eating or just addicted to food, that there's a, a variety of different factors that go in um, into the creation of obesity. And this is actually a multi-species model. So I want to call out that <laughs> the thought that there is interspecies mating in here. I do not think that that is a driver of human obesity, uh, but apparently it affects mice. 
Um, we also see that there's epigenetic mechanisms, population um, based population level things and cultural factors. And so we're going to walk through a couple of the more um, recent and interesting research or kind of salient components of the etiologies of fatness. And we'll be kind of doing that by category, starting with systemic and cultural factors. Um, so starting with a kind of um, larger nutritional shift, we know that um, globally there is a shift to more processed foods in our modern diet. Um, and I'm particularly gonna call out um, high fructose corn syrup as um, a bad thing. Um, this has sig significantly increased in recent decades. And not only does it have like a bunch of calories, but it's sh um, research has shown that it's actually different than other kinds of um, other kinds of ways that we get energy. Um, it blunts our le leptin si signaling and it um, promotes sensation of hunger. So it actually like um, will make us want to eat more. Um, and then um, urbanization has just increased our sedentary lifestyle. I think we all feel that. Um, <laughs> Um, and then poverty is, again, multifactorial. Um, there has been a lot of research on food insecurity and food stamps, and this um, is, again, probably multifactorial um, and um, affects com communities of color um, more than um, white folks and probably is a reaction to um, like a bunch of kind of stress as well as um, like access to um, calorically dense foods um, and is affects our BIPOC communities more than white folks. Um, and then um, nutritional density and cost, there's um, really interesting research um, that is very concerning that um, the cost of there's like soda is cheaper than milk. Um, and then there's been a lot of research on food deserts, which again um, affects um, communities of color more than white folks. Um, and then culture, I think, is um, really, you know, again, there's a lot of different ways that this can affect people, um, but the way that um, food and feeding culture um, can um, influence, like, how, how people, um, how people, uh, like, react to stress. Um, I mean, I'm, we are both Jewish, and so, like, our reaction to when things get bad or, like, Aren't what if you things are good? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, celebratory true. culture is real, too. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, and then different body mating ideals. And then a sort of mating, which is just a fancy term for saying that fat folks are more likely to date other fat folks. Um, and then there's a growing body of evidence about food addiction, um, particularly in relation to sugar. Um, and less so, but still in relation to fat as well. Um, and then racism is a huge um, mediator of chronic stress, chronic cortisol, dysregulation, and inflammatory factors. And this has been shown in a lot of different, um, a lot of different um, like uh, health conditions, including like cardiovascular disease as well as obesity. Um, and I'm just going to call out two particular studies. Um, there was a um, study among Asian and Latino Americans that showed that. Um, about in about 2,000 people that showed that um, instances of um, racism were associated with increased BMI and obesity. Um, and then among a large study of Black women, a Black women's health study, everyday racism, so um, instances of um, racism in everyday life and lifetime um, instances of racism were both associated with increased instances of obesity. Um, and they, um, did an interesting subgroup of analysis on residential segregation to see if that was another modifier and that um, did not show that, so. And we had a great question from the peanut gallery from my brilliant co-chief, Dr. Alice Tin, asking about um, when high fructose corn syrup became available on the market and how it correlates with weight trends. So it started being released, I believe in like, it was developed in the 60s, being released in the 70s and really didn't become fully integrated into processed food until the 90s, which does correlate very well with a pretty strong uptick in um, body weight in the population, along with a lot of other factors, including like urbanization and things like that. So it does correlate well, and there are many uh, confounding variables. So next I'm gonna be discussing some different environmental factor factors that go into the development of fatness. First being sleep. Um, 
which I like to blame for my own overweight status based on BMI, my sleep debt, so it's residency's fault. Um, sleep debt tends to increase food intake, energy storage, and the increase of the incidence of diabetes and heart disease. And evidence shows that chronic non-severe sleep debt can affect our um, ghrelin and leptin metabolism and balance and homeostasis throughout the body, um, lean us towards hunger and appetite primarily for um, energy dense food. So those, those of us who have survived a night shift and have deeply needed a carbohydrate and fat rich food, it's because of science. Um, next we move forward to the microbiome. Um, so thinking about how our own flora um, can affect our body size and that's something that there's a, a burgeoning amount of interesting research about. And also pathogens thinking, is there like an infectious kind of mode or an inflammatory process that could be driving obesity? And there's some pretty interesting research coming out about that. Um, endocrine disruptors, uh, like medicines, or sorry, chemicals that can be found in pesticides, plasticizers like BPA, bisphenol A. Um, and phthalates, which we can often see in other like personal care products and things like that, they can um, act by actually uh, inducing adipogenesis, and they can also um, alter our sex hormone composition, which can change the way that we store or not store excess cal caloric intake. Um, exposure to um, endocrine disruptors in some animal models um, increase the propensity for obesity. And lastly, pharmaceuticals, so iatrogenic causes. So many of us have put people on psychotropics, particularly antipsychotics, and um, have seen um, the way that it can affect people's weight and uh, also antihyperglycemics and even beta blockers. And we have another comment here from Thun Meat. Thank you, Thun Meat, for noting that the government is absolutely complicit in the propagation of high fructose corn syrup. And there's a, we did at some point have a slide getting into big agriculture, but then we felt that we were going to spiral. So thank you, anonymous attendee, for corn subsidies. They're bad. We all agree that GMO and different kind of big agriculture things disproportionately affect communities of color. And um, we thank you for bringing that thought in here. Um, finally, there's some kind of hereditary and kind of genetic factors um, in terms of intrauterine exposure. Interestingly, there's research that shows that both nutrient deprivation and potentially maternal overnutrition can lead to um, obesity later in life. And there's some iffier research about maternal age as well. Um, and then in terms of genetics and epigenetics, um, leptin and then um, propiomelanocortin, which um, both are mediators of hunger and the endocrine cascade, um, and both of which are actually common methylation sites, um, are sites for epigenetic change. Um, and then obviously intergenerational trauma can be a huge um, mediator here as well. Um, and then the thrifty gene hypothesis, which um, I mentioned because it was a big thing kind of a while ago, but hasn't really been um, it now is not thought to be like a huge driver, but maybe a little bit more of a driver. It's probably a little more complicated. Um, basically says that there are, we all have carriers of like the thrifty gene, which um, is a survival mechanism because in between famine, in famine, we like deposit fat basically. And the epigenetic read of that is that we all have those genes, but some folks, um, even when it, we are not in famine, actually express those genes and those folks are the folks that are fat. So of course we can't give you family medicine grand rounds without talking about medicine and our goal here is to um, see what research about what illnesses are associated with fatness and what aren't because I think we get a lot of um, informal education in the medical system um, automatically conflating increased body size with a variety of metabolic syndromes. And we wanted to really look at the research and see what the actual um, data shows about fatness and bodies. I think that there is a lot of panic about obesity causing increased healthcare expenditures. And um, I won't get into this too much, but in meta-analyses where they actually control for co-founders so that they take out um, they can take out obesity related um, obesity obesity related diseases. 
um, it completely collapses and statist becomes statistically, statistically significant with non-obese people. So this kind of supports our hypothesis that we should actually just treat people as their diseases instead of treating people as their body size. Um, and then there's a lot of um, talk about bariatric surgery. Is it or is it not? Um, does it cost that? Does it save the healthcare system money? Um, and overall, the effectiveness of this is like highly disputed. Um, in a large uh, VA study, um, initially healthcare expenditures increased and then kind of leveled out. Um, it definitely saves the healthcare costs, the healthcare system pharmaceutical costs, but probably um, is a wash in terms of um, overall healthcare expenditures. So we hear a lot about obesity and morbidity. We do know that increased body weight is associated with the development of me metabolic syndrome. So you'll see um, a lot of the diseases on the left-hand side, type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular problems, liver disease, such as non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, are associated with increased body weight. Um, of note, all of these are, all this data is based on BMI, which is, again, a flawed measure. Um, we also see on the other side that um, increased body weight also has decreased incidence of some illnesses as well. And that's something that we wanted just to bring to our attention that not, uh, A, not all fat people have metabolic syndrome, and B, not all fat people, um, fat people can have decreased incidence of some illnesses as well. Um, there's also this really interesting um, kind of association with mortality. Um, again, this is all based on BMI, which is a flawed measure, um, but it shows increased mortality actually at both ends of the spectrum. And this graph is really old. It's from 2006, but this data has been borne out again and again and again. There's just not a pretty graph from the newer studies, so I'm showing you the old graph. Um, but um, the um, basically, if your BMI is very low or very high, you have an increased risk of mortality. Um, and I think we don't often um, know that about the uh, lower ends of the spectrum. So some of you who may have peeked into the literature about body weight may have come across this very trendy idea of the obesity paradox, which is that um, for some illnesses, who, that fat people are more likely to have, such as cardiovascular problems, there's a paradoxical response that they are more likely to have improved survivability. So there are a variety of studies of a variety of um, the range of study design <laughs> is wide <laughs> and whether or not they, the, this data can be trusted, which is kind of why we're gonna challenge the idea of the obesity paradox. Um, it's really nearly impossible to study this without having a variety of confounders and collider bias, which is a, a more complex form of confounder. Um, so we see there are ways that you can look at the data and see increased survivability of obese patients who have COPD, who have stroke, who are in the ICU. But on the right-hand panel here, we'll see all the ways in which this research can be flawed. Um, we don't know because it's all based on BMI. We don't know if these are really muscular people who don't have a lot of adipose tissue who are doing better or if they're people who are really fat. We don't know if we're talking about visceral or subcutaneous fat, and we know that that does have clinical significance in the development of metabolic disorder and things like that. Um, this also brings our first mention of the idea of a metabolically healthy obese person. So the idea of the obesity paradox, like can you be a metabolically healthy obese person and actually have some survivability benefit, which we're gonna get into later. And again, like I said, there's a variety of different research related biases like selection and collider bias, which I'd be happy to nerd out with you. I had to draw a lot of graphs to figure out how to explain collider bias. And I'm happy to talk to you about that in the Q&A if you want to. Um, these are also incredibly methodologically complex studies and um, riddled with issues. And we're gonna kind of get into that, but uh, there's a growing body of literature challenging the obesity paradox and the studies that assert it. Finally, in terms of our medical considerations, we would be remiss to not talk about weight loss interventions. And I wanna be clear that we are talking about intentional weight loss here. Unintentional weight loss, as y'all know, is almost always medically a bad sign. Um, so we are talking about intentional weight loss. Um, and um, intentional weight loss, um, the weight loss effect basically off, often doesn't last beyond the intervention period. Um, diet and exercise um, can offer some long-term weight 
um, loss, and but it's um, almost always associated with partial weight regain. Um, and physical activity can improve mortality, but weight loss um, doesn't. Um, is, this is um, calling out in patients with CHD, but that can be true in other, um, in other conditions as well. Um, interestingly, um, in terms of us generalists, there is no evidence that um, our interventions do anything. Um, and then bariatric surgery for weight loss. Um, there is um, evidence that it decreases overall mortality um, from all causes, but it increases suicidality, um, increases with risk of suicide, um, which I think is um, really interesting and concerning. Um, weight loss does and can decrease um, risk of certain kinds of cancers, um, ejection fraction, and um, osteoarthritis pain. So now we're moving on to our section delineating the areas in which fat patients experience size discrimination. It pervades almost every aspect of life. So we're going to walk you through a day in the life of a fat person and call out some of the, of the ways that people experience size discrimination so we can have a better idea of what people are walking into our office room, our offices with, like what they're holding emotionally and what kind of discrimination they faced. It's really important for us as we're discussing this kind of discrimination about bodies to think about the ways that different identities intersect with the fat body and the other identities that can be discriminated against. So we need to think about gender, we need to think about race, which we've already talked about the ways that race has a really complex interplay with body size. And we're going to also further delineate that um, as well as like, um, um, ableism as we're relating to bodies that are not, that don't fit with our built environment. Um, thinking about intersectional oppression, we have this study from Philly, a small study with an N of 122, that specifically aimed to address intersectionality when looking at re repeat incident incidences of discrimination. We see here that weight and race are the most commonly reported reasons for discrimination, and about 82% of the people who reported weight discrimination also experience some other form of discrimination. This all to say that people hold a variety of different identities and when you combine multiply societally oppressed identities that people experience a compounding amount of discrimination. So the first thing in our day in the life, we're going to take a commute to work and see in the ways that um, in a fat body, this can make you susceptible to a variety of different inaccessibility, including the built environment, chairs, doors, hallways, bathrooms, and transportation. And Zoe's gonna take it away. Um, so this is a study um, that um, recruit, recruited from people um, prior to bariatric surgery, um, and it had a minimum BMI of 35, and some folks had BMIs of up to 80. Um, and um, in this study, over 77% of people had felt um, that they had been unable to fit comfortably into public space at some point in their life. Um, so this has a huge impact on our patients. So we are on our commute to work and we're going to get a coffee. And being a fat person, purchasing any form of nutrition in the public makes, you, um, makes one incredibly vulnerable to public scrutiny about bodies. Um, and here we start to bring in um, quotes from fat activists. Kitty Stryker is a prolific fat activist and body positivity activist. Um, and we're going, she has a, um, actually a guide for disbelievers on fat phobia on the internet that I encourage you to look up. But we're going to be um, incorporating some quotes from fat activists and testimonies from patients. The contents of my grocery basket are analyzed by people I don't even know. I regularly receive diet advice I haven't even asked for. Here we see, is this my slide? Yeah, yeah, okay. For people, so this is again a study, the same study looking at folks who are being reviewed for bariatric surgery. So for people with a BMI above 30, up to 49% of them felt stigmatized or discriminated in restaurants because of their weight. 42% have had strangers come up to them and suggest diets. And 28% of them have been told in public, you shouldn't really be eating that because of your size in public. Um, and then 25% have been um, criticized or commented on their choices in the grocery. So next, after you get your coffee, we're gonna head to work. And at work, um, you may face discrimination at basically all levels. So hiring, income raises, uh, promotion, um, job evaluation, firing. 
Um, so um, there was a, I looked at a 2015 systematic review of um, discrimination and um, five out of nine studies specifically addressed um, workplace discrimination. Um, and they looked at perceived workplace discrimination. Um, and in this study, they broke it down by gender and there were differences in gender. So 9.6% of women and 4.5% of men in the BMI range of 30 to 35 had um, experienced perceived weight discrimination. And that tripled if your BMI was over 35. Um, this um, actually has um, very serious consequences for your wage as well. Um, so there is differences. This is for white women um, based on wage. Um, and this is growing as you can see as the years go by. Um, there is no just um, there are only six cities and one state that have weight discrimination laws. Um, and our next place we will take you to the doctor's office. So this is our realm and unfortunately um, people in fat bodies experience negative provider attitudes. They experience insurance denial and infl inflated premiums and we're going to discuss some of the different stigmatization and discrimination people experience within the medical realm. And again looking at some quotes. When I go to the doctor I feel less of a person. I am only a weight problem. He'd ask me questions like, how could I let my get, myself get so big and if my husband has issues with my weight? They tell me that any health complaint I have is due solely to being fat. I sat through so many lectures about diet and exercise, hours of my life and their life wasted telling me things that I already know, that I'm already very knowledgeable about and that I already practice. My pediatrician was the first doctor I ever despised. Every visit, even if I went in because I had a cold or had a sprained my arm tree climbing, began and ended with discussion of my weight and what I was doing about it. So here we see anti-fat bias kind of in the built environment of our medical offices. Where does it happen? We see that we have the first, the moment you walk into the, the lobby, we have chairs with arms that don't accommodate bigger bodies, we have uh, scales that don't accommodate bigger bodies, gowns that don't fit on bodies. Um, people are weighed non-consensually and publicly quite commonly, and people also report experience of harassment by staff and patients. This is data from pre-ACA, but um, insurance pre premiums were higher for obese people, 22% than they were for smokers. Um, and in a survey of 20, uh, over 2,000 um, people, 69% of people had experienced weight discrimination from their doctors. So we can do better, you guys. Um, in a series of um, implicit bias tests from Harvard, um, you all may have taken these for race. These are very well validated tests for race, sexuality, and other measures of bias. Um, and I'm gonna talk about a couple studies for those. Um, so in the voluntary sample for these, um, you actually have to talk about your explicit values before you are able to take the implicit biases. Um, and in a sample of over 2000 MDs, um, there was strong explicit preference among MDs for thin people over fat people. Um, and this was stronger for underweight, normal weight and overweight MDs, but it was actually true for obese M MDs as well. Um, and then among implicit bias, there was strong implicit anti-fat bias among MDs. Um, this next study is among obesity experts. Um, and this, um, they, um, in the obesity experts, they compared um, a study basically now with um, a study in 2001. Um, and um, this is people who are working on this issue and they did explicit and implicit and they um, used four different words. Um, and compared with 2001, there was actually decreased levels of implicit bias, which is the graph on the right, um, but increased levels of some explicit bias, which is the graph on the left, ex particularly around the words bad and lazy. So it's particularly concerning that even among people who are doing this work, there's massive amounts of bias. 
having experienced a great deal of discrimination in the medical sphere, we're moving into the social sphere and we'll see here ways that people experience uh, discrimination in their social and public lives. Uh, another quote from uh, Kitty Stryker, I've had my ass grabbed, my stomach touched, and my arms pinched by strangers commenting on my weight. I've had people working at clothing stores ridicule my body. I've had police officers taunt me when trying to make a report as a victim of a crime. I've been threatened with rape, assault, murder for being fat. So here we see the impact of anti-fat bias. So this is um, by youth, youths who are experiencing <laughs> bias or bullying based on their, this is for height and weight actually, but we see here the, um, the odds ratio of the impact of that negative social impact. So people lose, they lose friends, they stay home from school and they um, stay away from school activities and get worse grades. Um, so harassment has a significant impact on people's schooling. Um, this is an interesting study where a thousand participants were presented with hypothetical situations that related to um, whether or not they would uh, choose to give, um, like adopt, um, and likelihood of being helped following a serious traffic accident. And the one to 10 um, thing on the bottom is based on BMI. So 10 is largest BMI. Um, so, and it shows that fatter people are less likely to be chosen for adoption um, and helped in traffic accidents. And all of these situations were particularly for women. Um, so we've taken you on this like terrible journey through a day. Um, and so the reason for this isn't to say that, um, you know, this is the way that it has to be. The reason that we did this is to show that our patients come into our clinics having experienced this stigma throughout their lives and that often our healthcare systems and our clinics are actually a part of that. And our argument is that our, the stigma and discrimination like plays a large role in our health and our patient's health and um, can play as big of a role as, a bi as the biologic and ph physiologic implications of fatness. And we need to figure out what, what to do with that. Um, Again, in the words of some fat folks, multiple times I would have to tell my doctor, okay, now that you've got that out of your system, tell me what you would do with the thin person. The cold hard fact of the matter though, is that now I just don't go to the doctor. I suffer through infections and other illnesses alone and without help because I've been made to feel so ashamed, embarrassed, guilty, and ignored. So we see the variety of ways that stigma threatens health itself. Um, people, um, fat people are more likely to have delayed presentation to care. And in these qualitative studies, they report fear of being weighed, fear of being told to lose weight or discomfort undressing at the doctor's reasons for delaying care. People are less likely, fat people are less likely to be up to date on routine screenings like pap smears. And we've seen the variety of different kinds of healthcare avoidance that happen because of stigma. We also um, know in a variety of um, research has shown the correlation between discrimination of a, of a variety of identities and cardiovascular health. So a lot of us are familiar with studies linking microaggressions against Black and African American patients um, with increased blood pressure. And we also just uh, some other data here about discrimination and cardiovascular health in general. Uh, we also know that stigma, particularly against fat people, has been shown to increase cortisol levels, um, again, presenting a correlation between stigma itself and physical health. So here, um, O'Brien proposes kind of this spiral of weight stigma. So we have someone experience some kind of weight stigma and then they internalize that. So they internalize the messages they get from people and from society that they are bad, that they're lazy, that they're worthless, leading obviously to psychological dis distress. And O'Brien argues that this can lead to further disordered eating and increased weight causing further stigma. So we've, gone over the history of BMI, we've kind of questioned the obesity epidemic and what we can do moving forward. Um, we've qualified that the discrimination that fat people face um, can negatively impact their health. Health. How can we move forward? How can we change the script and change the future for our fat patients? Um, so we promised you some alternatives to BMI. We are not proposing that these are the answer, but we um, think they may get closer to studying what we want to study um, rather than using antiquated stuff like the BMI. Um, we, again, like these are, 
things that are proposed in the literature right now, we aren't saying these are definitely the answer. Um, but there are some other objective measures, um, such as body composition. Um, and then some people propose using just metabolic measures like insulin sensitivity, lipids, leptin, inflammatory markers like CRP are being used. Um, and then body measurements like waist circumference and waist to um, height ratio, waist to hip ratio, thank you. Um, interestingly, those measures, when they use them, they actually collapse the obesity paradox. So what that means is when they use them, um, they do not show the increased survivability of folks that have increased waist circumference or waist to hip ratio. Um, and then you could also just ask patients about their physical fitness and activity and take out what they look like altogether. Um, this is the um, biggest, hottest, newest thing in obesity research. Um, metabolically healthy obese or metabolically obese normal weight and metabolically unhealthy obese, metabolically unhealthy obese normal weight. Um, and they, these are defined differently in different papers, but if you look at obesity research, almost all of the newest stuff is using this. Um, it still uses BMI, um, and there's lots of variation on exactly how specifically how they define metabolically healthy and metabolically um, obese, but um, they use some combo of like insulin resistance, blood pressure, and inflammatory markers, depending on the paper. Um, what we like about this is that it, at least acknowledges that not all fat people are metabolically unhealthy and that some thin people are metabolically unhealthy. Um, and we like that it acknowledges that there's some nuance in the data. Um, so it is an interesting, it, it, it is an interesting framework. So thinking ahead, we desire to, uh, Think creatively as we're thinking about the future of how we treat our fat patients. Um, some of these ideas are meant to be a little bit provocative. These are things that Zoe and I kind of come up together when we're <laughs> brainstorming a radical future of medicine where fat people get treated better. Um, and just some like ideas of how we can rad radically re reconceptualize the way we think about fatness. And none of these are meant to be like, this is what we should do. Just thoughts and ideas about how we can reconceptualize. So should we conceptualize obesity, obesity the way that we do addiction? So addiction is um, making slowly the shift from being seen as this individual moralized issue, someone who's like let themselves go, can't make, can't control themselves. And slowly the medical institution is trying to shift it over to a disease-based model. And I think here in Seattle, we are, it's pretty widely accepted that addiction is a disease um, and not an individual moral failing. And like we have medical institutions who have defined it as such, is that the widely accepted understanding in the, the general population? Absolutely not. Um, but I think seeing that how that transition has been made away from moral failure is interesting and like wondering the ways that we can apply that to fatness as well. Do I want to define fatness as a disease primarily? Not necessarily. Um, but what I also like about it, the, the addiction type framework is that it offers the idea of harm reduction, um, which is something that we're going to kind of talk about in the way that we address fatness in the future. So what if we have, uh, we see our fat patients from a harm reduction standpoint, like this patient has the body they have and they're happy with it and that's okay. And how can we reduce their risk of developing metabolic syndrome and things like that? Um, what if we think about it as a disability? Um, we are borrowing this from radical disability studies and not kind of the most common way that people think about disability. So from the radical queer disability movement, we, we see disability defined as a failure of the built environment to accommodate the needs of an individual's body. So a disability is not someone because they're in a wheelchair or like their fault because they're in a wheelchair. It's a failure of the environment to meet the needs of that person. So a similar way for um, fat bodies that, um, fat people, excuse me, that like, it is not, it's a disability because the environment is not built to accommodate them appropriately. Um, thinking about shifting from a disease model of obesity to a demedicalized um, kind of view. So like, what if we stop medicalizing body weight itself, but think about other factors. Um, I also want to introduce the idea of the health at every size movement. There is a variety of criticism against the health at every size movement, particularly among fat activists. But I think it's a nice middle ground for people who are just being um, introduced to body positivity in medicine. Um, so I'm gonna just take a quote from their website. Um, 
Health at every size is a movement for making peace with bodies. It supports the idea that people of all sizes can address health by adopting healthy behaviors. They believe they have, quote, we have, quote, lost the war on obesity. Fighting fat hasn't made the fat go away. Um, and being thinner, even if we knew it successfully how to accomplish it, doesn't necessarily make us healthier or happier. So um, it's something that uh, I would encourage everyone to look up on the internet to see what the Health at Every Size movement is. You can take a Health at Every Size pledge as a provider. Um, and then thinking most radically, what if we empower our patients about their bodies? What if we tell patients or help them feel beautiful? What if we help people have pride in their bodies? What if we um, told people that pe their bodies are not their enemies and how would that affect their health? Um, so Dr. Zoe and I probably um, talk about weight a little bit differently in our practice than other providers do. So if my patients ask me like, is my weight okay? I often tell them, I don't care about the number on the scale. I care that they love their bodies. I care that we keep it healthy in a way that healthy means for them. Um, and my patients come back to me. Um, not to brag. <laughs> I'm an awesome doctor. Um, but like, it's keeping people coming back to the doctor because you don't shame them for their body weight better for their health? I think probably yes. I don't have data to support that. Um, here we see we're going kind of from the, pro the very basic, um, this is uh, quotes from fat people saying what they would like people to do. So very basic things, give respect, give eye contact, have bigger blood pressure cuffs, um, all the way to focus on what I came in for, don't treat every cold that it's because I'm obese. Um, and then I love this one at the bottom, ask yourself, what would I tell a thin person? Um, and finally, we're going to have some takeaways, and I'm going to ask you all to do this as a repeat after me in your little Zoom boxes at home. Um, so I'm going to say it, and then you can say it back to me, okay? Um, so fatness can increase health risk, but fatness does not always increase health risk. Fatness is multifactorial, not an individual moral failing. Fat people can be healthy. Stigma harms fat people and contributes to poor health. Providers need to question and address assumptions about fatness and health. Thank you for playing along with me. <laughs> and finally, I'm just gonna leave you, um, I wanna, we wanna end with the words of fat folks themselves. Um, my doctor didn't fat shame me and it was a radical life-changing experience. I had never before met a doctor who thought that my impressions of my health and wellness were as valuable as his own. This was such a precious and magical gift. After all those years of thinking that my body as an aberrant monstrosity, I was fighting rather than an inexorable and valuable part of me. Thank you so much for your time this morning. We have a plethora of different sources that you could peruse on your own time and we're always happy to discuss this in person or via email and we'll stop our screen share now and open it up to q a and we have 11 percent battery so we're gonna fix that um fun meat thank you stigma leads to more unhealthy eating yes and the neuroscience shows this over and over for how we respond to the stress of criticism um and yes, it is a societal issue and harm reduction. And thank you so much, Tommy, for your time. We really appreciate it. We're happy to take other questions either. Um, I don't know if you can talk. Question from chat. Can you see the chat? Do you need me to redo the question from chat or can you see it? We see it now. Okay. Uh, regarding common medical dieting advice for weight loss, my understanding is that cyclical dieting, yo-yo dieting, very common, particularly among women, is not only ineffective, but actually alters baseline metabolic rates, making it more challenging to lose weight in each future cycle of dieting. Did our reading come up uh, of the literature to support the negative implications of dieting cycles? Um, interesting. Yeah. I actually didn't do a bunch of research on how to do effective weight loss because um, that is not my um, goal for most people. My goal for most people is body acceptance and kind of, yeah, um, like, um, so um, I would be interested in doing more of that, but my goal for this grand rounds wasn't actually 
figuring out how to do that. So I don't have a bunch of advice for people who want to lose weight. I did do some reading about cyclical dieting and um, our, I don't know who wrote this. Oh, it was Shannon. Thanks, Shannon. Um, uh, yes, I did do some reading that it can alter our kind of like hormone homeostasis and make it like for, uh, further difficult to lose weight. So um, there are some interesting studies of like questionable validity looking at um, the number of times you've tried to lose weight and the, su and the success you can have, but it does diminish over time. And there is, I would argue that there's probably some metabolic baseline for that and also some behavioral kind of stuff going on as well. Great. Thank you so much for joining us today. If you have any other questions, please feel free to contact us individually. Are there things in the Q&A Answered. There's okay. Um, um, I also, we actually talked a lot and we didn't have time to do some modeling of language, but I think both Molly and I spend a lot of time kind of thinking how to, thinking about how to um, talk to our patients about how, um, weight and um, how to, um, yeah, how to like talk through language with them. And so if anybody wants to think through that with us and wants more language and wants to um, strategize and plot the, plot the revolution. Not us. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Hit the subscribe button for more medical content.